Good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining. We're just waiting for a couple of more people to log on. Um, and uh, we'll be with you shortly. I can see that number down the bottom grow. Uh, we had close to 100 people register today. Um, so we'll give them we'll give them an extra couple of minutes. Hello, Ruth. You've asked a question in the chat. Yes, you are definitely connected. This is us four people. Uh, we're just waiting for a few extra people to log on. Sometimes people, um, you know, those last minute things that happen. Linda, you've raised your hand. Uh, please use the, the chat if you want to ask a question at this stage. We'll, we'll see if we'll uh, be able to open up um, the Zoom for everybody to... Um, <coughs> via camera and audio, but at this stage, it is the chat on the bottom of your screen. Uh, please use that to ask any questions. Yes, Linda, thank you. Thank you for making sure you're definitely there. It's really nice to have you here. Um, just a few more people uh, logging on, giving that five minutes. I'm looking at that lovely golden retriever I think not that I know my pets behind Helen you've got it right he is a golden retriever <laughs> <laughs> he or she looks beautiful thank you he's asleep on my feet <laughs> oh, he's, yours. he's yours he's mine yeah he is mine beautiful um thank you Doug 10.35, good morning, good morning. Um, welcome to, to this really important conversation. My name is Marika and I am the CEO of Coda New South Wales. And this topic has been a topic that people have asked uh, for us to just have a conversation about. Um, I imagine that there's no one uh, here that has not been impacted by an animal, whether it's been your own pet or whether it's been someone else's pet or um, perhaps wasn't a pet, perhaps was an animal in the wild. I doubt um, that no one, you know, that anyone here hasn't been impacted by an animal. Um, these conversations are important. They are an opportunity to bring uh, experts people with lived experience and professional experience in a wide range of um, fields um, to our CODA community to discuss the issues that matter to you. I begin by acknowledging that I am here on Gadigal Wongle land um, and I pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. And I know that people are coming from a whole range uh, uh, different parts of, of New South Wales and maybe beyond. So a very warm welcome to you. I'm going to ask you, before I even introduce this amazing group of people online um, who are going to educate us, entertain us, share with us um, the highs and lows of pet ownership, I'm going to ask you to use the chat and put in the chat the name of an animal that has had an impact on your life. Uh, so just put a name of an animal that has had an impact on your life. And as you do that, um, I also want to acknowledge that um, those of us who are uh, animal lovers or who have had animals in our lives, um, sometimes these conversations can be a little triggering um, you know, particularly those who have maybe lost Zeus or Scruffy or Sweetie or Jamie or uh, Marjorie. That's a nice name. Thanks, Di. Um, <laughs> Revland. <laughs> Thanks, Pete. Hello, Pete. 
um, animals play such an important part of our lives and have, you know, have done so, take us back to ch childhood for sure. Um, too many to list. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Well, a very warm welcome to you all and um, thank you for sharing your pet's uh, name um, and maybe uh, that's brought some nice memories or even currently reminded you how important um, animals are in our lives. Um, I really do encourage you to use the um, chat uh, to make a comment, to maybe ask a question. There will be opportunities to engage in a conversation at the end um, of every speaker. We're a fairly small group, it would appear today. Um, so what we may do is if you do want to ask a question and you're comfortable uh, around that, I might just turn your camera on and your audio on. So I do encourage you to think about that. But um, to get us started, um, and to hear about the amazing work of the Companion Animal Network from Australia, Australia, uh, CAN, I warmly welcome Patricia, known as Trish Ennis. Welcome, Trish. Thanks for hanging on and um, for being here today. Oh, hi, Marika. Thanks very much. So, um, yes, well, Companion Animal Network Australia is... Um, basically the peak body for pets, whereas RSPCA look after all animals, we look after just pets and the relationship between pets and their people. Okay, so I believe we're getting this display organised. There we go. There we go. So we're the National Voice for Companion Animals. Uh, and the people Sorry to interrupt, Pet. Just a thumbs up from people in the chat. Can you see that presentation? Just somebody let us know. Yes. Can everyone see that presentation? Yep, you're on. Great way to go. Thanks. Great. Okay, next slide, please, Jess. Okay, Australia enjoys one of the highest pet ownerships per capita in the world. We own more than 29 million pets. Next one, Jess. The companion animal impact is two thirds of every three Australian households own a pet. There are 29 million pets and 26 million people. That's And there's $12 billion is the amount of money that Australians spend on investing in their pets each year. Jess. $4 billion is the sum saved yearly in health costs due to cat and dog ownership. 83% is the number of Australians who have owned a pet in their lifetime. And Australia has one, as I said earlier, one of the highest levels of pet ownership in the world. Yes. Now more than ever, pets are an integral part of our life. And I think um, during COVID, there was such an increase of pe uptake of people taking getting pets. During the past few years, we've been closer to our companion animals uh, than they or us could have imagined. Thanks. Who we are, um, CANA is a registered charity representing the companion animal welfare work of our six member agencies. Together, our members provide rescue, shelter, rehoming, fostering, healthcare, and enrichment services to more than 50,000 animals every year, as well as social programs that advance pet inclusion and welfare in all areas of society. Why it matters, our movement fights for a society that recognises the positive impact pets have on people and the world where every pet is, has a loving home. Jeff. Our members are Animal Welfare League Queensland, Animal Welfare League South Australia, Lord Smith Victoria, Sydney Dogs and Cats Home, Dogs Homes of Tassie and Safe in Western Australia. 
Uh, as I mentioned earlier, our members provide uh, rescue shelter, foster, foster care and enrichment services for over 50,000 animals per year. Just Every day we work towards a pet friendly Australia by sharing the knowledge and rallying support to develop and promote programs that deliver high welfare standards for animals and also humans. Helping Australians enjoy the many benefits of pet ownership and supporting the trauma of surrendering ownership to due to accommodation, age, health and financial hardship. This, the next slide is, is these are just a few of the things that we work on. So educating children with pets, promoting the benefits of pets in aged care, assisting emergency desexing programs, bringing together landlords and pets, uh, and helping create pet friendly businesses. So these are just a few of the programs. We use our national voice to lobby government for legislation and policies that will improve life for animals. We help protect the bond between older people and their pets by providing resources, practical assistance for residents and pets and aged care settings. We ran a survey earlier last year and 95% of um, believe that pets in aged care create positive mental and physical health outcomes for their owners and their pets. We are working um, with aged care, residential care places, where we have created policies, um, paperwork, anything that they need to enable people to be able to move into residential care with their pets. Um, we also are lobbying government at the moment to have pet support included in the home care packages. So that's hopefully, if we keep pushing with your help, we'll be able to get that through. We promote the benefits of pet friendly workplaces also Work is the leading source of stress worldwide. One in five Australians take time off due to work-related stress and anxiety. 45% of people believe that pets in the workplace create more relaxed atmosphere. What does the research tell us? Pets improve well-being, mood and relaxation capacity. Pets support psychological resilience during ageing, Pet ownership reduces loneliness and offers older people comfort and a sense of safety. Pets can be a catalyst for community connections. And sadly, older people are relinquishing pets or deciding not to continue to be a pet owner, perhaps fearing what would happen should they no longer be able to care for a pet. So hopefully we can actually turn that around. The fact is companion animals are essential for well-being, psychological, spiritual and frequently physical. That's why we say the extraordinary value of the human animal bond is worth fighting for. So that basically gives you a background on who we are and what we're doing. Um, if you go to our website or go to, we've got three websites. One is australiacan.org.au, which will tell you all about us. Uh, the other one is Pet Friendly Aged Care, which will give you all the resources and you'll be able to see the research that I was talking about. And we've got a Rent With Pets website as well, which is basically where we try to, which is working so far, uh, change a lot of the rental laws around Australia to make them pet inclusive. So thanks very much. Yeah, thanks, Trish. Thanks, thanks for that. I've just put the um, the CAN website um, on, on in the chat there. Um, you got a question here from Lynn. Please tell us laws in each state for pet ownership and stratums. Um, I'm not sure if you can necessarily answer that, but can you give it a crack? Uh, yeah, stratums are individual. Uh, it's a little bit different to straight rental. They are up to the the body. The, the strata body that are looking after the places. Um, one thing that we've learned with retirement villages, for instance, they are becoming more pet friendly and we're working with them as well. But as far as normal strata, it is up to the, the place. But with some of the laws, uh, for instance, in Victoria and some of the laws around the different states are coming towards this, is if someone applies to rent a property and they have a pet, 
the if the landlord or the agent says no to taking that pet, they have to apply to VCAT themselves to get it stopped. Uh, as long as it's reasonable, you know, the, the place has to be pet friendly, you know, they've got to have a backyard or a, you know, lock up area, the cats have got to be inside at the night time, various other things. But honestly, it makes it a lot easier to the straight out, no, you can't have a pet. Thank, thanks for answering that. I am blown away by the numbers of pets in Australia. Yeah. Um, tell us a little bit about how you got that data. Well, we did re research um, and we've worked with a lot of partners uh, across the country. Uh, so we've worked, we've worked with RSPCA and we've worked with various other um, places and charities and so on. But the data, Animal Medicines Australia, uh, so there's a big, big group that work with pets and animals. So we've all pulled together and got the research done through that. Yeah, I mean, I think data is really important. Trish, we're going to come back and talk a little bit about the advocacy work you're doing, particularly as we age and if we do move from our, you know, home into a residential aged care facility. Um, you know, how can we do more to engage and ensure that pets also have the opportunity to move with us? I, I'm sure there'll be a number of questions. I know I do have that. So thank you um, for, for sharing a little bit about the amazing work you do. Um, people online may not know that you're a voluntary organisation um, and that uh, like most uh, good voluntary community-driven organisation, you run on the smell of an oily rag. Oh, yeah. um, but that kind of work that you do and the advocacy and the research can only be uh, accomplished through passion and um, you're certainly very passionate about companion animals and I thank you for it and I'm sure many others will too. So um, let's um, let's pause on, on, on Companion Animal Network Australia for a moment and just move our attention to the RSPCA um, uh, we're, we're lucky enough to have two people from the RSPCA today, Dr Gemma Maher and Helen Trussler. Um, but it's uh, Dr Gemma Maher that um, I'm going to be introducing now, who is a community vet. Um, and and I, I think we agreed at the beginning, Gemma, you're going to talk a little bit about yourself before you talk a little bit about the amazing work you're doing. So very warm welcome to you. Thanks, Marika, and thanks for the opportunity to be here. Uh, so I've been a vet at RSPCA for 13 years now. Um, I've moved away from being a clinical vet in the, in the clinics um, to doing more work in our community department, um, out in the community working with our social support programs and our outreach programs. Um, and also what I've done at RSPCA is a big evaluation project looking specifically at our social support programs so we did a social return on investment evaluation of those, uh, which is why I got nominated to be here today, because um, I've had a really deep dive into our aged care program um, and to what pets mean to older people and to how RSPCA can help um, people who are struggling to look after their animals. Um, so looking at the data, probably the same data that you were looking at, Trish, um, <laughs> it's about 60% of Australians aged 50 to 69 um, and 45% of Australians aged over 70 have pets. So it's a lot of people with pets into older age um, and they're really important. What we find is actually animals take on a whole different level of meaning as people age and become more socially isolated and lose those other connections in the community. Obviously, animals are providing affection, opportunities to nurture, um, providing social support for people as well, a source of joy and happiness. Um, they can also increase connections with, with the community. So being able to take a dog for a walk means you can have conversations with neighbours and um, be connected in your community. But we also know that having an animal companion can lead to a whole lot of stress for people as they age. Just the day-to-day -day basics of caring for an animal can become quite difficult as mobility becomes an issue. Things like cleaning litter trays, taking dogs for walks can become a challenge. But also from interviewing a whole bunch of our 
aged care clients. We've found that things like um, the fear that people are going to become sick and need to go into hospital, having to go into hospital and have treatment, having to move into accommodation with um, more support, um, and the fear of losing their animals is really significant. It causes a lot of anxiety for people, um, which is kind of where our programs come in. Um, Jasmine, can we put the I might put the video on now? So we have a community programs team at RSPCA that supports people who have caseworkers who support people who are struggling to um, to care for their animals in crisis situations, um, but also with day-to-day -day care as well. So the aged care program is one of a few programs we've got. Um, and this is just a little summary of that program. Disability service came forward to us, advising that Alan lost his um, beloved pet. He lives alone, he's very socially isolated, has no family or friends. So I was set on a mission to find Alan a new dog. I first met Benji when he first came into the shelter, um, and I believe that Alan and Benji were a really good match, and the rest is history. Benji requires ongoing medical assistance, and um, we do home visits to Alan, um, give him advice. Benji. We also pick him up, take him to the vets and get him regularly checked over by one of our vets and drop him home. Oh, he's so wonderful. And if he doesn't like a thing, he'll, he'll let me know. He'll growl at me for taking his, his um, harness off. And if I want to move him on the bed so that I can get in, he growls a little bit, you know. Well, I, I like that. Good on him. My day as a caseworker can be different from one day to the next. We have to be ready for different situations. I can be taking phone calls to new inquiries, being rushed out on a new job, picking up a client's dog, going to a hospital or rushing an animal to a vet. Alan was recently diagnosed with terminal cancer. It's a big relief for Alan to know that we're here for him and Benji and the ongoing care which Benji may need takes a big pressure off his shoulders. I can't do without the RSPCA because they look after his health. They check him every month or so. They give him his free and then worm tablets and I've got nothing to worry about, you know, because they're so wonderful. I just couldn't do without him. We're such good mates. Can you go to the next slide, Jasmine? Thanks. So our aged care program is just one of a few of our community support programs at RSPCA New South Wales. We also have a domestic violence program, a homelessness program. Um, why am I blanking on the last one? And an emergency boarding program that help people who are experiencing crisis of various different kinds. Uh, so our aged care program supports people aged over 65, um, people who are socially isolated who don't have um, friends or family that are able to assist them with their animals. We also support people who are in palliative care of any age as well. Uh, we take a lot of referrals from human services, from hospitals, um, and also from our inspectorate, uh, as well as having people who refer themselves to the program. Um, where We only support people who are on a... Um, Centrelink benefit um, and our program is constantly oversubscribed. Um, we have just a huge amount of demand for our services. So actually our, our aged care program was a first community support program that we developed at RSPCA New South Wales. It was probably about 20 years ago now and it grew out of uh, a need that was identified through our inspectorate. So we have an inspectorate that enforced the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals Act. They um, go out and investigate reports of animal cruelty and neglect. And they were getting a whole bunch of calls uh, to investigate 
animals belonging to older people and they're finding this isn't cruelty, this isn't neglect, this is a person who's just struggling um, to look after their animals. Uh, so that's where our the aged care program was born. So basically we have a team of, um, sorry, can you go back to the last one? We help with emergency boarding. That's a really big one. And that's kind of where it all started, where a person, an older person would go into hospital suddenly and the animal would be left at home with no care. Um, and so the inspectors would be called on to enter the property because they have those powers um, as part of their role to enter the property to go and retrieve those animals and take them to safety. Uh, and that still happens all the time. Our inspectorate and our programs team work very closely together. So we provide emergency boarding or ideally foster care for those animals while people are in hospital or in respite. Um, we try and get these animals into foster homes because they do much better, obviously, in a home environment uh, than in a shelter. We also assist with providing veterinary treatment. We transport animals to and from the vets or to boarding. Um, we help people access. Um, of, often the cost of veterinary care is, is difficult to manage when you're on a pension. Um, so providing payment plans to make those services more accessible um, and also helping with some home visits to provide the basic veterinary care, like help with grooming and nail trims and putting worm um, flea and tick treatments on and those sorts of things. Okay, next slide. So we have a wonderful programs team at RSPCA New South Wales. All our caseworkers work across all the different programs, not just the aged care program, um, but basically a team of caseworkers. They all have an animal background as well as a human um, services background. There's a lot of co crossover in their expertise, um, but they're just amazing people who really just love the animals and really love people and want to help um, find the best solutions. So I'll go to the next slide. So a couple of years ago, we did a big evaluation project, as I mentioned. It was a social return on investment evaluation uh, where we interviewed a whole bunch of stakeholders um, and also collected data through questionnaires from our clients, um, also from our RSPCA inspectors and our programs team, um, and also from external stakeholders like aged care service providers uh, to try and understand the social value that's created by our program, how it how it actually translates into impacts. Uh, just pull up the figures. So we looked at the 2020-2021 financial year. Uh, and in that year, just through the aged care program, we supported 292 animals belonging to 215 clients. So most of those animals accessed emergency boarding or foster care. They spent a total of 3,604 3, days in care um, and they accessed um, almost $86,000 worth of veterinary treatment. So the really big benefits that we found of this program was that people were able to keep their animals um, and they're able to um, experience an improved bond with their animals. So 84% of clients were able to keep their animal or improve their bond and 49% experience improved social inclusion or decreased isolation. And we found that for every dollar invested in the program, there was $5.77 of social value created. And I've got some quotes from clients. So I interviewed in depth um, half a dozen of our aged care programs clients, um, which was really eye-opening for me just to see the value that these animals had in the people's lives. It was really, um, um, really quite amazing. So Nancy said, I didn't have to worry about my Frankie, everything essential the team looked after. It gave me a great peace of mind. I'll never forget the help I received from RSPCA New South Wales. If not for RSPCA, I would have mental health problems because of my frustration. I would worry more about Frankie than I would about my own health. And this came up time and time again. I thought that the main impact of the program would be that we'd prevent animals being surrendered or euthanized because people couldn't keep them. But actually, it was kind of the reverse. People would make all of the sacrifices to keep their animal and to stay together as a family. So people were delaying getting the treatment that they needed for their medical problems. They were delaying going and having the surgery they needed, and they were delaying going into assisted living accommodation where they were going to get better support, um, all because they just had to stay with their animal. They couldn't give them up. 
I'll go to the next one. So Charles said, unless I could find somebody to look after her, I would have had to surrender her. I had nobody else I could give her to or who could look after her for me. So the gods intervened and decided that I should keep Daisy, and so they found RSPCA New South Wales for me. So again and again I heard this relief when people just got the help to keep their animal, just this huge relief. Um, there was It just created so much anxiety, having that uncertainty about how to care for their animal and how to stay together. And the next one. So this is from an aged care service provider that I interviewed. And they said, well, I, would, I won't put a dollar value on it, but I'll put a couple of years on it. I'll say five years on someone's life. Having their companion animal extends their life for a good five years at least. And this came up time and time again as well with clients saying, well, if I didn't have my animal, I wouldn't have a reason to stay alive. They are the thing that's keeping me going. They give me purpose. They give me something to do. They give me a reason to get out of bed in the morning. And Frank really reinforced that as well when he said, yeah, it makes my day, you know. You know, some people stay in bed, they're done with that and don't care. But I care about Coco. I care about her, so I care about myself. I look after myself. And that's it for me. I think I've probably left out lots of things, but I'm sure Helen will cover everything I've missed. Oh, that was terrific. That was terrific. The amount of work that the RSPCA does and some of those statistics, again, uh, linked to the statistics that, that Trish shared earlier. Um, it not only is it sounds like the right thing to do for people, it actually makes good economic sense to also support people to keep their animals. Um, as we moving into ageing longer and, you know, having uh, experienced, you know, that longevity, um, we need to find good ways to um, keep people in community longer. And I think those stats really play a big role, Gemma. Um, can you talk, think about a story, Gemma, or a, 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 a one particular person that you've met or an animal that you've met um, that really uh, shone a light on the fact that animals are so critically important? Has there been one story of late that has really stuck with you? I think um, Charles and Daisy, one of the quotes was from, from Charles, um, was a really great example that just summed up all of the things. Um, Charles was living by himself and he had his little dog. I've changed their names, by the way. Um, but Daisy was a little scruffy muffin that I think was um, probably similar to Harry McCleary, a little scruffy terrier. Um, and they were just best friends, but he, he really had nobody else in his circle. Um, he needed spinal surgery. Um, he had a tumour in his spine and that was something he needed. He put it off for six months because he couldn't find anyone to look after Daisy. So he'd reached out to all the local vets and the boarding facilities. They were going to charge him something like $50 a day to board his dog. And he knew it was going to be like out for weeks um so he ended up finding rspca and we boarded daisy for a few months while he recovered um and then daisy went back to live with charles and in the recovery period because he couldn't walk daisy he reached out to his neighbors and he ended up meeting one of his neighbors who was a widowed um older lady similar age um who now takes her for walks every day so because of daisy um, he has that friend and that social connection. Now they meet up and have tea on a regular basis and she takes him, takes Daisy out for walks. So I think that was a really nice example of how it all comes together, how a dog can actually create a community for an older person. That's a terrific story. I'm sure there's many more, but just a lovely, lovely story. Um, please use the chat please ask questions please share your thoughts um really important um topic that we're talking about and that's the uh the impact on on animals and pets on our lives um i do want to introduce helen trussler who is the head of gifts and wills at the rspca um and uh obviously has her own beautiful animal in that photo in the background. Um, welcome, Helen. Thank you, Marika. Thank you um, for the opportunity to uh, be here. 
Um, and yes, absolutely everything Gemma said, uh, obviously, as we all work in RSPCA, uh, we understand the huge impact that um, that the that we're not just older people, but all people that come through our doors have um, uh, on owning pets and the stories that they take tell us are amazing. But um, just to add to, to Gemma's presentation there, so obviously there are times uh, where people do find themselves in a position where they're needing to move into um, non-pet friendly residential care or even nursing homes um, entering palliative care um, and then as the stats say um, people do worry quite considerably about what will happen to their pets should something happen to them and we do find especially when we talk to people in events um, you know that they've said oh we've always had a pet you know we've always owned dogs we've always had cats or whatever it might be but um, we're now elderly, we've retired, um, and we don't feel like we can get one anymore. Um, and, and my answer is always, why? And, and they're always, the, the answer is always, because we're worried about what will happen to them if anything happens to us. Well, the, I guess RSPCA is all about keeping people with their pets for as long as possible. I mean, that's what we are all about. And, and, I, and I think Trish said the same thing. It's about advocating for pet care, regardless of where you're at in life or, or who you are or what you're doing. It's really important to be able to hold on to your pets. And, and Gemma's, Gemma's stats obviously reiterate that. Um, so we introduced a program called Home Ever After. It's actually been going for a very long time, actually, right back to the 70s. Um, but it's it's obviously evolved as, as pet care has evolved in Australia. Um, and it's now in its current state, it's been running for around almost 10 years now. Um, and basically it covers uh, people that are in decline and, and have no longer the ability to look after their pets or they unfortunately do suddenly predecease them. Um, but it's basically um, a program which allows people to, um, I guess, in some ways, pre-surrender their pets to us. Um, but they're able to hold on to them until such times as as, as the inevitable happens. Um, and what that basically means is that we enroll them into this program. And so should something happen to them um, that they do predecease them or they go into palliative care, um, and, and as Gemma said, often um, the pets are left in the home and, and, and sometimes we're unaware they're even there um, or, or the ability to actually access them and, and get them into safety. So the Home Ever After program basically means that once you've enrolled your pet, if anything does happen to you I and mean, you are taken um, sooner than we hope, um, then we're able to go in and uh, the ownership of your pet immediately transfers to us. That gives us the legal ability to be able to look after that pet um, and do all the necessary that we need to do to be able to rehome them into a similar home to the one that, that the people have actually offered all the way through their life. Um, and that's it's a beautiful program. People, some not we don't advertise it hugely, um, but uh, it's a beautiful program that when people do enrol, they they tell us the feedback they receive. We receive is that um, they feel incredible peace of mind, just knowing that uh, should something happen to them, and it, it it doesn't always have to be people over the age or in retirement in their golden years. It could be anyone. Um, my pet's enrolled in it because I live on my own and I do a huge amount of traveling um, and and you never know what's going to happen on the road right um, or some people you know you can have ailments that may take us quicker than we would hope um, and and you do worry what's going to happen what's going to happen to my pet if anything happens to me while I'm when I'm out on the road or, or whatever it may be um, and so people enroll their animals in home ever after to give them that peace of mind and um, to know that should something happen um, that they will be looked after. Um, and I think another element of the program is also trust. It's, 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 RSPCA is a very well-known household brand and, and a household name that people know and, and trust. And we've been around for more than 150 years now. Um, and we have experts that are doing adoptions every day and doing behaviour assessments and health checks. We've got the whole veterinary um, clinic backing us up all the way, all over the state. 
Um, and, and that means that they know that when they enroll their pets on this program, that they will be given all the all the welfare that they need um, should they come into our care. And I think that really does, give, as I say, give people that peace of mind that um, that their pets will be looked after. Um, and, and it's very reassuring that um, we have that. And it's a it's a program that I'm very, very proud of. So um, it's if anybody would like information, you can go onto our website um, and just check in Home Ever After in the search and you'll find all the details on there. Um, equally, another program that I just thought I'd mention while we are here is because we do um, believe it's really important. In fact, one of the most important times of our lives to own pets is in older age, because often the children have flown the nests. Uh, you may be widowed early or you may be widowed or or whatever it may be. You may live on your own anyway. And as you get older, obviously, that loneliness can um, be quite impactful on our lives. And so we know that having a pet, just the sound of four paws or whatever it may be, it doesn't even need to be four paws. It could just be a fish, a bird, or whatever it might be having that extra presence in the house is very reassuring um, in, in many respects uh, from a security point of view, from, from just, uh, just starving off the loneliness sometimes. Um, and we all do live on our own a lot and, and we do live in a lonely world these days. So pets are a huge advantage in, in actually um, just having that lovely extra noise, that tapping of the feet, that somebody to feed, that somebody to walk, that somebody to look after. Um, but often, often we find that, uh, you know, the cost of, of um, getting a pet can be quite excessive um, in, in certain times. But obviously, rescue um, are much, much cheaper. I advocate for RSPCA rescue. Um, but um, another program that we introduced to, to help that barrier in terms of owning a pet is uh, our Seniors for Seniors program. Um, and that is something that we run with the New South Wales government um, through the Senior Savers Card. So if you're a senior over the age of 65 and you have a Savers Card or a Senior Savers Card, um, you're able to actually access uh, senior pets. So we match up seniors for seniors, um, um, which again is a beautiful program because um, as you get older, you might not want a kitten, you might want a puppy that takes a huge amount of effort and, um, and training and everything else. And obviously our seniors, are, and our, we class a senior is over the age of eight. Um, uh, they're already accustomed, they're already trained, they're already litter trained, they're already uh, slowing down if they're a dog generally around that age. Um, and looking for just a lovely relaxing environment and a, a nice retirement. So a nice peaceful home, a nice comfortable lap to sit on. So um, we introduced Seniors for Seniors where we match up some um, animals stay in our shelters for maybe a little bit longer than they need to because of their age, because um, some people don't want to inherit uh, an older dog um, uh, or an older cat. Um, but obviously other people, it's very conducive to your lifestyle to have a senior in your in your life. So um, we thought we'd introduce that. And we did that about three years ago. Um, and that basically means that with a savers card, you get 50 percent off uh, uh, seen at uh, the cost of an adoption for an older pet. So it's a significant discount. Um, and then beyond that, um, you also receive discounts in a veterinary clinic to then obviously um, look after that pet going forward. So all of those discounts and benefits obviously really add up to um, enabling people to have pets in their older years. So I think um, Anything that we encourage, we can do to encourage people to one keep their pet and not surrender it too early, um, because they may be going into a, a, a dog, for, a, a not pen friendly home, um, or any way that we can alleviate some of the um, stress from a financial point of view, so that can they can continue owning pets as they get older, um, is something that we really believe in doing. So. Again, if you want to know more about either of those programs, you can find those details on our website or equally give me a call because um, I'm, you can just ring RSPC and New South Wales, ask for Helen because I'm the only Helen that works here. So <laughs> you'll get through to me. Um, but um, look, I mean, it's it, both programs are beautiful and, and all the programs that we run um, yeah, are really important as we get older, I think. So um, don't hesitate to contact us if there's anything we can help you with. Thank you, Helen. Thank you. You know, another great number of examples of the good work that's being done 
by the RSPCA and others. We do have a few questions or comments um, on the chat, and I'm going to encourage everyone to um, to keep um, to keep asking. Um, one of them really relates to the relationship with paramedics or the AMBOs in, in, in New South Wales. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what happens when the AMBOs turn up, somebody's really unwell, has to go to hospital, and the pet's going to be alone? What can happen there? How can we help those pets and that person, uh, give that person peace of mind as they cart it off to hospital? Gemma, do you want to ask that or do you want me? Um, I can answer. You might have things to add, Helen, but um, it's definitely something that comes up a lot. That's often how animals end up in our programs uh, is that the person's gone into hospital and either a neighbour or the hospital has um, has realised that there's an animal left behind without care um, and that's when our inspectors will go out and pick them up. Um, and that's part of the recommendations out of our social return of investment was that we really need better integration of services to uh, include animals as part of the family when we're doing planning for patients in hospitals. Um, when people are asking questions about um, people like social workers asking questions about what's going on for a person, make sure you include the pets, make sure there's a plan for them. Um, so, yeah, it's really important. And sometimes they still get left behind. Um, so, yeah, a really important part of planning that we we want animals included as part of the family when we're when we're planning treatments for people. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks. Add to that. So, I mean, with the Home Ever After program, and I think we will always all say this, I think we have a responsibility to obviously um, make sure that we're looking after pets, both in in, in health and in, and in death. So with Home Ever After, um, if you do enrol your pet in that, we give you... Um, for instance, fridge magnet to put on your fridge and paperwork so that if the emergency services do come into your home, one of the first places they generally will look is, is there any advert to say that we've got, we're enrolled in a program that will look after the pet and it's very clear, um, we we tell our, our supporters to put the magnet on the fridge so that the emergency services can immediately see that the animal is enrolled in the program and they can immediately ring us and we have a volunteer um, ambulance service that uh, goes all over the state and we will actually go and pick the animal up, animal up from the home and bring it into the closest shelter. Um, so again, that's a huge peace of mind because that can be turned around within 24 hours. Um, and so we know that that pet's not going to be left on its own um, for any extensive amount of time. And that, again, will give that person peace of mind knowing that they can go off in an ambulance and we will be there within a few hours to pick up their pet. So um, that's another big advantage of that program to, um, to highlight as well. Thanks, Helen and Gemma. And thanks, Margaret Yates, for um, asking that really critical question. I think it's um, really important. We've got this other one, another question from Di, goes back to the program. Um, uh, uh, is it Home Evermore? No, Evermore. What is it? Home Ever After. Home Ever After. That's the one program. Um, if, there's, if you've got a change of pets, um, over time, do you still have to re re enroll or does it carry over irrespective of how many you have? It's a perpetual program in that respect. So um, obviously we know that, you know, animals will pass that are enrolled and then uh, somebody may well um, then obviously bring another home, another animal into their home. And what we basically do is you just literally update us to say um, one's died or one's passed away and, and uh, we've now got another one and we literally just um, add them onto the program um, with another enrolment form. So it's a very, very easy. And, and, and that's what it encourages as well is, is knowing that there's always a plan in place. Um, as Gemma said, it's so, so important to have a plan for your pets going forward. And um, I, I work in the business of, of, of wills. Um, and again, it's it's having that complementary plan in your will as well. So should you pass away all of a sudden that your pets are also referenced in your will, especially if you want them to go to somebody particular. Um, because um, in, in New South Wales, um, pets are still deemed as property. Um, and therefore, um, the ownership of that pet um, on your on once you're deceased 
moves to um, any other beneficiary in your will. So that person could be selected and that might not be the right person that you want to look after that pet or even have the capability or the um, financial resources to be able to look after that pet. So if you have a specific person that you want them to go to, that should be referenced in your will to say, I want Fluffy to go to my neighbour, my daughter or whoever it is. Otherwise, what will happen is they just get passed as any other asset um, in your will that you haven't specified. And that means they're given to anyone. And unfortunately, the responsibility of that rests on your executor to choose the person. And that's assuming you have a will. So if you don't have a will and you do have a pet, make sure you get a will because you really do need it. It's really important to have that future plan in place, especially as we get older. Um, to ensure that any pet that you have is always looked after. And, and I can't emphasize that enough, how important that is. I've, I've seen too many um, bad stories that, where, they, where they've been left behind because no one wants them. So um, Home Ever After and your will complement each other. Um, and so, um, yeah, it's, it's very important to have that if you've got a pet. Yeah, thanks, Helen. Thanks, Helen. And thank you, Di, who also asked a follow-up question. Um, does the Seniors for Seniors operate in other states? Um, do other uh, RPCAs have a similar program? Um, Home Ever After does. It's a national program. So we merge across borders because obviously lots of people do um, live on the border. And, and what we would do is, is Home Ever After, as with all their programs, is run as a very animal centric program. Um, and so whichever shelter, even if it was, for instance, um, if you lived on the border of ACT and you were closer to ACT, we would take the animal to ACT shelter and then have it transferred. So um, distance in Australia is obviously very great and we take that into consideration. So we do merge Home Ever After across borders. With, new, with the Seniors for Seniors program, um, currently, I can't really answer that question because it's a, it's a, it's, we work with the New South Wales government on that program to be able to offer the benefit. Um, so it is something that's through the New South Wales Savers Card or Senior Savers Card. Now, you may well have the equivalent um, in your own state, and I'm, I'm not familiar with every other RSPCA would have the same setup, but... Um, I don't believe it is. I think it's at the moment just individual to New South Wales. Okay, that's great. Um, Pete Newman um, from the Central Coast, one of our leading advocates, also made a comment. Um, I know that Pete's had extensive experience in, in, in help. He has said social work departments uh, are generally really alert to um, supporting people who have got pets. Um, and they actually also usually include the necessary arrangements. Now, Gemma, you, your experience might be a bit different and not all local health districts are the same. And, uh, as a social worker, not all social workers are the same, but we certainly are um, aware of the importance of ensuring pets are covered off. Um, and we know that people also resist going to hospital because of their pets. It's probably something that's worth adding on that is that a lot of people who come into our programs are people who have no other support. So they're not linked in with any services, even though they could really use them. Uh, and their animal is their way in to accessing those supports. Um, so often the first sign that there's any issue with a person is that their animal, the neighbor notices that the animal's matted and um, needs a groom and they call it into our cruelty line and the inspector goes out there and realizes, oh, wow, this person really needs a lot of support. Um, so actually the animal can be the way into accessing those um, human services as well. Indeed, indeed. I just want to turn our attention, Trish, we have not forgotten you because I think part of the, thank you, thank you to Gemma and, and Helen, but stay on because there's a couple of more key questions. So keep those questions and comments coming on in the chat. We're really appreciative. Um, Trish, the advocacy around um, ensuring pets are included as part of your sort of extended network, particularly when you uh, need to or make the decision to move to a retirement village or an aged care facility. Linda um, online has said, look, this is the reason why I joined today to really listen, is how can we really drum up the advocacy to ensure pets are covered up? What do you need us to do, Trish? You're probably on mute. 
Yeah. I am, so coughed. <laughs> Um, there's a number of things that we've got going. Uh, we are talking with residential care places nationally. Uh, we're running a database of places, retirement villages and residential care places that do take pets. Uh, on the uh, Pet Friendly Aged Care website that we've got, you will see there is a kit there that the residential care places can download and that covers their policies, it covers everything that they need to then take on board people with pets. The other thing that we are really, really fighting for at the moment is to get pet, pets included in the home care packages. Um, the government says, you know, they are looking at, they want people to stay home longer. And I think as us baby boomers get a little bit older, we would be staying home longer because we're healthier than the older people were. Um, and if they're looking at a holistic view of how do we keep people at home longer, well, they've got to include these people and their health benefits. Their health benefits are their pets. So that, I mean, it just makes sense. You know, and it wouldn't cost the government a hell of a lot of money. Uh, when I did, I'm running a petition at the moment, which hopefully you guys can put up online. Uh, the, the more the merrier that we could get people to sign and, and make comments. I've taken this to the government already, to the federal government. Um, in my last meeting with them, he said, oh, well, hold on. You know, I said, well, what's the difference if you give someone a taxi uh, care uh, voucher to go to the doctor. Why can't they use that taxi voucher to go to the vet? Um, there are a lot of charities that will do dog walking for people. That why can't they be supported? Uh, there's if the aged care package, if the 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 company has a service to look after the pets as well, that's an extension to their business, which is terrific. Um, with residential care, I'm in Victoria and I've been working with one place in particular, LifeView, to help build these policies. Um, LifeView have people knocking their door down, trying to get in. They've got four places, nearly six. Um, the database I have is national. Uh, I'll be putting that up online so the residential care places that can come on board will be able to put down their place as pet friendly place. Boopa have um, joined us, which has been terrific. Uh, so yeah, the the more get onto our website, have a look, sign the petition, and any support, go to your local member, uh, go rather than the federal. But we just need to get it out there and get it pushed through, and it will be people power that does it. Indeed. Well, I've just put, thank you, Trish. It is absolutely people power. I've put the um, petition in the chat. You just double click that. I'm now, I think, the 18,723rd person that has signed your petition. I hope others online today also sign it. It's a really critical piece of advocacy. And can I say, as someone um, who visits Bupa at Clinton Park, mm -hmm. uh, uh, my dog Zorro is a featured guest and um, plays such an important role, not only for my mum when she's having residential respite, but also other residents who um, light up when, when the dog comes in and, you know, hangs out for the day. So, mm. um, it, you know, animals, as we know, and the evidence is there. Um, if those people who require the evidence, the evidence is there. Um, but it's pretty uh, pretty clear that pets make such an important um, impact. Um, Di, you've got one more question online, and it really is about an idea um, uh, about uh, possibly the RSPCA giving out small pet emergency cards to all pet owners so they can put them in their wallets, um, just like we do almost with our next of kin. Um, Di is asking, do you do that or is that something? Yep. So Helen's nodding. So do we. <laughs> and so, so, okay. We so, already have wallet cards as part of that program. Um, 
and uh, we at certain periodically we actually also do the emergency stickers for your window so the emergency services can see there's animals on the premises as well um some people like them some people don't because obviously it allows people to realize that there are pets in the house which can be good or bad but um but no we do have them so if 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 uh, i think act have a particular wallet card that they um give out regardless of any program but um yes we have we have them if you if you'd like one and 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 thanks helen and and trisha saying can has them too uh mm. So how, Trish, how can people get a copy of the wallet card? Well, just uh, email me, info at uh, australiacan.org.au. And ditto for the RSPCA. I suspect, Helen, we could just... Um, um, As a part of the Home Ever After program, um, so we would definitely have wallet cards available under that program. So, yeah, again, if you enrol your pet, you you get the wallet card and the whole pack. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Just, um, Marika, just going back to um, to Trish's comment, um, just in terms of lobbying, you know, often people think, oh, I won't bother, it won't get anywhere. Um, but just to um, say how powerful lobbying can be, certainly in the pet space, um, only a couple of months ago, uh, uh, basically New South Wales Parliament put up a petition online um, to ask for people's um, opinion on having pet friendly ferries in Sydney um, and uh, not just ferries, but the whole metro network, which is probably most people know you couldn't take your dog onto a train um, in, in New South Wales and certainly not in Sydney. Unlike Victoria, where all pets are very are, are actually welcomed onto trains, um, but um, so they basically put a petition up and said, "What's the opinion of the public? Do we want them on on our trains? Do we want them on our ferries?" Um, I think it was something like sixty six thousand people actually signed that petition in favour of it happening, and it's just been recently announced that the New South Wales government will be adopting the Victorian Metro ruling on animals on on trains and ferries now which is a fantastic result so it does work Trish it does work doesn't it to actually um fill out the surveys and tell us what you think because they they do listen not always but they do listen most <laughs> of the time we try hard <laughs> but we, yeah, try hard. we were involved with that one too with the yeah pick up well yeah. it was great yeah. and I think the more we all band together RSPCA can uh, and the other charities, for instance, um, band together, the better results we're going to have. Mm, exactly. But we need people power. <laughs> yeah. People power. People and that's power. why I sign that petition and share that petition, and we'll certainly be sharing it um, online. Thank you to Sharon, who has said um, that she lives in a, in a village in the Hawkesbury, um, and they're actually allowed to have two small dogs um, too small to medium sized dogs. And she had said, look, you know, what works is that when people pass on, um, there is always someone in the community to take care of that dog. So yeah. she's a piece of mind. Beautiful. Um, Beautiful. Yeah. I mean, we certainly need more pet friendly communities. Um, that's for sure. That's for sure. Um, can we, we've talked positively, and I don't want to, um, and I will, you know, revert back to that. But can you, Think about um, the lows of pet ownership um, uh, in your old age. Um, what's what? What would stop you getting a pet um, in your older age? Um, what's not good about having a pet? Let's be honest. Um, can you think of anything that's not good? What is a low of pet ownership? I can kick that off. Um, it's, it's the loss. It's the loss, I think, is very, very hard to to cope with, um, especially if you are on your own or and that is your person in life that, you know, your fur baby, whatever you want to refer to them as. It's I think that's a big fear for people is is how they're going to cope with the grief and, and the grief for pet loss is is as bad, if not worse, in some ways than losing a human. Um, because they do give us such unconditional love and they do fill such a big hole, especially I think in in the 21st century households that we live in. So I think that is a big fear for some people is how they're going to cope with that loss. And 
there's lots of websites and lots of resources now that um, take people through that grieving process. Um, not just for older people, but for maybe children that have experienced the loss of their pet. As we all know, that often um, the first experience of death for children is either their grandparents or their pet. Um, and there are lots of resources online to help people, uh, parents, uh, navigate through that for their children and equally for older people to, to get help with that um, in terms of some counselling services just to work themselves through that grief. So I think off the top of my head, there's lots of, Obviously, um, there's a few negatives, not many, fortunately, but I think that is a big one for older people is, is dealing with that loss and maybe not feeling that they can replace that animal because they are at a point of, can I continue to look after a pet as I get much older? So it's that fear of how do I replace? Do I replace? What do I do? Um, so I think all of that is, um, is it brings on a lot of anxiety for people, yeah. And also yeah. there could be, you know, oh, right, now I'm at the age I need to get some travelling. Mm. And I want to go travelling. Well, at RSPCA have boarding, so have our members. They've got short-term boarding and support for those sorts of people as well. So, again, it's all about the care plan that you've got around your pets. So there will be people that can help. Um, there's the fear of... I had a heart attack last year, but I lost my pet the year before. What if something else happens to me again? Again, RSPCA and the CANA members all have those support systems in place to help support you with your pet. So there is no other. I mean, if you do the pros and cons, the pros are just totally outweigh the cons because you have got support systems there. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, thanks, Trish. Um, I think that's that's certainly the case. Um, you know, um, Ruth um, from the Central Coast has posed possibly a low. Um, she shared a little bit of frustration living on the Central Coast. Uh, two dogs down the street seem to be um, caged in or locked in, fenced in most of the time. The dogs are actually uh, barkers. They've tried to to complain. Um, to local council, uh, she can't understand uh, why people have dogs and keep them locked in, uh, don't go for walks, uh, drives her a little bit crazy. Um, she's approached the people, but she doesn't seem, they don't seem to think it's a problem. Um, any advice of what um, Ruth could do next around that? It's a really tricky one and dogs bark for all sorts of reasons and sometimes the ones that bark all the time without stopping are dogs with separation anxiety, which can be very distressing for the dog and for the family as well who owns the dog as well as neighbours. Um, there's not a lot you can do as a neighbour. You can talk to your neighbours. If that doesn't work, you can go to the council and make a complaint about a nuisance dog um, and then leave it to the council to investigate and follow up. But I guess also be aware that that can be a scenario that is also very distressing for the dog, but also very distressing for their owners too. Um, and often they're doing the best that they can. Thanks, Gemma and, and Ruth. Um, you know, sorry, we can't give you another answer on that, but it sounds like you've done all the right things. Um, but you've obviously got two dogs that um, are needing something in that backyard. Um, there's a question here for, from Di, Trish. Um, to you uh, about the kind of survey on pets in various forms of aged care. Is it still open? Is the survey still open? Yes, um, absolutely. We did write our document uh, probably mid last year, but we've kept it open because we believe that the more data that you can collect, the better. I mean, the, everything's data driven nowadays. So yes, please jump on, it's on the website. Jump on and fill it out. Yeah. Terrific. Linda, you have your hand up and so do you, Jeanette. Do you need to have your hand up or is, did you know you had your hand up, your virtual hand? Did you want to ask another question? I'll let you go on the path in the chat. 
No, all good. Thanks, Linda. Um, well, I think we're, um, you know, nearing the end of this really important conversation. For us at CODA New South Wales, the issues that matter to people over 50 are the issues that we really want to be able to tackle. What we are always pleasantly surprised at is just the depth of human organisations um, like, and I call them human organisations, um, representing um, a whole range of causes, causes in this instance, it's animals, um, like CAMA, like RSPCA. I mean, we are really, um, uh, you know, we really can affect deep, long, lasting change um, if we do work together, if we do use the evidence, if we do share the stories and we do talk about the things that matter. And I think the highs and lows of pet ownership are obviously critical um, for, for our members. I want to thank you all for your time, Gemma, Helen, Trish, um, for hopping onto this webinar. I want to thank everybody also online um, for taking the time to join. Um, we are scheduled to have another webinar in um, at the end of March, and um, it's slap bang at the end of Seniors Week, and we'll be talking about intergenerational issues, uh, what young people think, what older people think, um, and looking at um, that, in fact, there's really not that much difference, um, and the solutions are there. Uh, very warm uh, thank you to, to everyone. Helen, thank you. If there's anyone interested in the Home Ever um, program, please contact the team. The number is there. This will be downloaded. I'm going to call for any last comments, um, any last questions. Um, let me know. You're online. Thanks, Trish. We're getting from David. Hello, David. David's our president. Um, thanks for joining, David. Um, and thank you to everyone who's there. Um, we will um, we will reconnect. Um, so adios from us. We get an early mark. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, Julia. Trish. Very, very, very thank you. Thank you again. Oh, anytime. Anything I can do. Thank you. That's a really, really great, um, great feedback. We'll um, email you, but thank you kindly. Yeah, no drama. Thank you. See you later, Marika. Just waiting for everybody to log off. Thank you for the feedback, everyone. It's um, really nice to have you on. Thanks, Lynn. Julie. Thanks. Thanks, Di. Thanks, Bruce. Leanne. Thanks, Jackie. And on that note, see you all next time, everyone. Thank you so much. Bye.